Hello, Linden. It's Larry Bash, again representing the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation in the city of Linden. We are continuing our program of uh, the Senior Citizen Lecture Series. We're doing it on uh, public TV because of this uh, pandemic we're trying to uh, survive. Uh, it's probably the safest way to do it, but unfortunately we don't have the interaction we used to when we had face-to-face -face sessions and very engaged discussions. I continue to invite people to email me if you have questions that I can answer in real time when you watch this. My, uh, my email address again is Larry Bash, L-A-R-R-Y-B-A-S-H-E at AOL.com and I'll answer questions or <laughs> so if you've, if you've sent me comments, sometimes you don't always agree with some of the things I'm saying and I appreciate people speaking up. Um, the other thing is it would be helpful if you would register with the Parks and Recreation people uh, for the lecture series because now the only way we have to give you backup material or handouts is to mail them to you and of course we don't know where to send the material until you give us uh, the information that's in your registration. So um, now in many of the talks the having the handout material, the backup material is not necessary to enjoying the lecture <clears throat> or learning from it but there are a few topics that it's greatly enhanced to have the, the backup material and the only way we have no way on the public TV to show you uh, the materials that we would ordinarily be handing out and discussing as a group. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe and I hope you're enjoying the lecture series. Uh, remember if you, the schedule of the, um, each lecture is on the city website. Um, and if somehow you can't meet the time of that lecture, uh, the uh, people here put it on YouTube at some point and then you're able to access it again off of the website and watch the YouTube uh, replay at your leisure. Uh, today is the fifth of our six spring lecture topics. Um, the five of the six um, were specific requests from people who are participating in the program. <clears throat> the sixth and the last one is one that uh, I put together from comments after a previous program um, last year. Um, the topic of this talk is the U.S. presidential election of 1948. It has been described as the biggest political upset of the 20th century. It's the election that pitted um, incumbent President Harry Truman, <coughs> who took office after uh, FDR died, very soon after he was elected to his fourth term. Um, so he served almost the full uh, time of a term. I mean. Uh, FDR died only 80 some days after he uh, took office for his fourth term. So Harry Truman stayed for almost a full four, four year period and chose to run again. And that's the 1948 election. <clears throat> his opponent was Thomas Dewey, the Republican governor of New York. Uh, his uh, running mate was another Republican governor, Earl Warren, a name that we remember from his Supreme Court days in the 50s, who was at the time governor of California. Um, uh, Tom Dewey, uh, who ran in 1948 representing the Republican Party, had also run four years earlier. Uh, so he had sort of the advantage of having just run a full national campaign, which of course, um, the incumbent president had never done because he was uh, the running mate of um, FDR in 1948. It's the third different vice president that ran with uh, FDR in his four runs for election for president. You 
sure remember from the history books that um, FDR broke with tradition and uh, ran beyond the second term. And he also, in addition to running for a third term, he also ran for a fourth term. Um, after that, there was a there was a constitutional amendment that we, you may recall, we discussed in our lecture on uh, amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, it uh, limited the president to uh, full two terms um, to be elected to. We have had in our history an example of similar to Harry Truman in which he was taking over for a president that, um, that died early in office. Uh, the one obvious example is Theodore Roosevelt, who uh, uh, William McKinley died very soon after winning his second term, and Teddy Roosevelt was his vice presidential candidate, so he served almost the full second term of William McKinley, and also, like Truman, ran for re-election um, the next time up, and did not run again. That's the same decision that Harry Truman uh, made after he ran uh, and won re-election. He decided not to run for another term, although he could have, even though that 22nd Amendment had passed. It didn't apply to him because uh, he had taken office uh, during the adoption of that amendment. Um, the <clears throat> We had a couple of requests for this election, and it, it, is, a, it is a fascinating uh, election um, because it was a big political upset. Uh, Thomas Dewey was projected the winner almost from the beginning right up to the end, and it was a big surprise that uh, Harry Truman won re-election. Uh, but also, um, the next sixth and last session we're going to have, which will be on uh, May 10th, will be about uh, third party uh, candidates for U.S. president over the years. Um, and in this case, we had in addition to the, in this election in 1948, we had in addition to the Republican, the traditional Republican and traditional Democratic nominee running for president, the Democratic Party had split and uh, there were two other Democrats that were running under a different party banner at the same time that uh, Truman was facing uh, Thomas Dewey. Uh, a, a particular challenge and part of, the, part of the reason why people assumed that Truman was gonna lose is that he had two other Democrats running also where Dewey was, was, uh, did not have any split in the Republican Party. Um, So uh, originally people asked about this election, which uh, you know we, we did do a course here, uh, a six week course on the history of US presidential elections more than a year ago. And, and this election came up because it's a little unique. It was a big upset. There were um, you know, a big split in the Democratic Party. So we had two, two what we would call, refer to as third party candidates. And it was a, um, you had a lot of drama about uh, FDR running for a fourth term and the change in his vice presidential running mate. So it does relate to our, our next uh, um, lecture also. But in addition, uh, people asked for that this uh, discussion of this specific election, but they also asked for some other uh, issues that were related to it. So <clears throat> we're expanding the topic to be covered to be more than just the specific election in 1948. We'll be talking about how Harry Truman ended up being selected as FDR's running mate the fourth time FDR ran. Um, then uh, a little bit about the Truman presidency itself. Uh, you know, we had this phenomenon in the 20th century in which we had, you may recall, we had a, a discussion in a course on act, what we called accidental presidents. That means presidents that uh, 
died in office and were succeeded by their vice presidents. There were four um, in the 1800s, and in each of those situations, <clears throat> the succeeding uh, president was, did not do well and uh, was not able to run again. Uh, contrast it with the 1900s in which each of the four presidents that ex succeeded presidents that died in office all were uh, successful, meaning they were able to run again and won. The first one was Teddy Roosevelt, in, uh, who ran with William McKinley in, in 1900. William McKinley was assassinated in Buffalo very early in his second term, and Teddy Roosevelt served at that full term, and he won an additional term in 1904. You had the uh, uh, death of natural causes of Warren Harding in the 20s, succeeded by Calvin Coolidge, the former governor of Massachusetts. In addition, in a similar way, Calvin Coolidge chose to run for a full term on his own and he won. That was um, uh, 1924. Uh, then you had the case of FDR who died very soon into his fourth term, succeeded by Harry Truman, and Harry Truman ran again and won, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but also he was he's generally considered to be a very successful uh, president. And we had, of course, the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy, succeeded by his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, who again ran in 1964 and won overwhelmingly and is increasingly being viewed as a successful president, even though uh, he had the uh, problems associated with the Vietnam War and the anti-war feelings about our venture into uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so, FDR was elected <clears throat> in 1932. Uh, he was only the uh, second Democrat, I should say, the third Democrat elected to the presidency after the Civil War. We had Grover Cleveland in the 1800s. We had Woodrow Wilson in, um, in 1912, who we also had a lecture on Woodrow Wilson if you, if you participated in that. And um, he was also the beneficiary of a third party candidacy uh, on the Republican side, and that's the only way he won initially, and he just barely squeaked by running for re-election in 1916. Remember, he's the president said he kept us out of war, and then 18 months later we were in World War I. Um, so there were a long string of Republican presidents after uh, the Civil War. Well, they directed the, they were the winners of the Civil War, so the Democratic Party uh, had to overcome that burden and uh, it took a while, <laughs> but they eventually did. So FDR uh, ran in 1932. That was the election uh, during the Great Depression. He defeated an incumbent president. That doesn't happen very often. Herbert Hoover was the incumbent. Uh, and of course, the problem was, was the Great Depression. Uh, the few times that incumbents have been, um, not been able to be successful in reelecting being reelected, uh, often the issue was the economy, which usually is the overriding issue in most U.S. presidential can, uh, um, elections. Uh, so FDR won in 1932 overwhelmingly, uh, defeating the incumbent Herbert Hoover. When he ran for reelection in 1936, it was a seminal election because there was a major shift in the support for the Democratic Party. It was the creation of the uh, Roosevelt Democratic Party coalition that survived all the way till 1968. And that was the coalition, unlikely coalition of, uh, of blacks, uh, Southern conservatives, labor, uh, and he held that, he won with that group, that, which was the big shift. Uh, you may recall uh, that uh, there were the uh, black voters generally were Republican um, after the 
Civil War, uh, they won their right to vote based on the victory by um, Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party in the Civil War. So they were traditionally Republicans, but by, the, by 1936, they made a big shift to support the Democratic Party, mostly on the issues of um, economics. But also, uh, there were issues of race and uh, civil rights in addition to that. Um, so, um, now, his running mate, FDR's running mate for those first two elections, James Nance Garner from Texas. Um, it was an obvious uh, ticket balancing effort. Uh, FDR at the time was uh, governor of New York and, uh, and Garner was from uh, Texas. Um, the story of uh, FDR choosing to run for a third term involved changing his running mate. Uh, when the time was approaching for the 1940 election, uh, FDR was very coy about it, and he didn't express clearly that he was willing to run for a third term, which was a big departure from tradition, from beginning with George Washington. There are presidents in our past who wanted to run for an additional term. Uh, U.S. Grant was one of them but they never were successful at it. And there were, pl there were plenty of candidates that ran mul multiple times and lost, which, like William Jennings Bryan, who three times ran for president and was not the winner in any one of those three contests. Um, so he's very coy about it. And going up to the convention, he still hadn't announced his intentions. There was no one that was like stepping up uh, to challenge uh, him running a third term on the Democratic side, and essentially he manipulated the party to the point where they came to him and asked him to run for a third term. And clever, I mean, the idea was uh, he wasn't seen as seeking it, he was being sought out. And it was difficult times, you know, where we're, he was dealing with uh, a, a domestic economic crisis at the same time we had international issues, which would eventually lead to World War II. Um, and, you know, that probably had a lot to do with the desire to keep him in control. Uh, well, part of this um, effort to get him to run for a third term put him in a position to tell the party leaders that, look, uh, I want, a, I want a different vice president, and I want Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace was um, a liberal uh, from Iowa. He was a farmer. He was a journalist. He was uh, a big advocate uh, of uh, civil rights uh, uh, advances and a, and a number of other progressive issues. Uh, he was, uh, at the time, um, uh, FDR's uh, Secretary of Agriculture. When, when, when FDR sat down with Henry Wallace about being part of the administration, he said, I'll give you any cabinet position except Secretary of State. And um, he chose agriculture. And he had a big impact uh, on issues dealing with agricultural subsidies and the economics uh, challenges that farmers were facing. And he was really uh, quite a popular person but not among the party regulars who didn't trust him, didn't like his liberal policies. And um, I, I don't know if they felt he would not be a good uh, candidate to run with FDR, but they definitely didn't, didn't like his uh, policy and his uh, politics. But under the circumstances, FDR was in a position to make that demand. So uh, Henry Wallace was his vice president, during his third term, was a big advocate for the uh, New Deal, uh, took a very active role in the war effort, or preparing for war. Uh, an example, one of many examples, was he sent Henry Wallace down to South America to uh, 
uh, convince uh, several South American governments to stay away from the Nazis uh, because there was a presumption that we would end up in a war with um, uh, the fascists. If, uh, if not the fascists in Europe, the fascists in the Southeast. You know, we, you, you may, any, I don't know if any of you that are listening to this participated in the course we had on war presidents where we discussed how uh, over time the president has taken over the power to declare war when actually in the Constitution it's, it's Congress. Um, but also uh, we examined how presidents addressed the war issue and how they executed their responsibilities during the war. Uh, we spent a special amount of time on a separate lecture on Abraham Lincoln because what an interesting story. Um, he won election originally as the first Republican president. There had been, the Republican Party was formed in 1854, but um, um, their first presidential candidate, James Fremont, lost to James Buchanan, the Democrat, but in 1860, Abraham Lincoln won. He was a, an unusual, uh, out of office, former member of the House of Representatives um, candidate who was not the most, as we discussed in the course, not the most logical nominee, but he outlasted. That does happen with the nomination process in those days, which took a lot of time and it was done at the convention. Um, and he was like the second choice for uh, many people. The, the overwhelming favorite turned out not to quite have enough to get over the, um, the nomination process, in part because of his anti-slavery, uh, ironically, his anti-slavery position. Lincoln had a more nuanced position that he didn't want slavery to expand. He doesn't want to challenge it where it was, but he didn't want it to expand in the new states as we had our Western expansion. And that was also a case of a third party candidates uh, in terms of Abraham Lincoln. So um, as you approached uh, the election of 1944, you had a very ill FDR. And I, I'm not sure the general public understood how ill he was, but the inside people, the politicians did. And there was a strong feeling that if he ran for a fourth term, his vice president would likely become president during that term. Uh, and the party leaders rose up and um, opposed uh, keeping uh, Henry Wallace on the ticket. And um, unusual set of circumstances because usually in our history the president gets to pick his vice presidential candidate. It's occasionally been thrown open to the convention. Maybe some of you may remember in 1956, Adlai Stevenson was the Democratic nominee, threw it open to the convention to choose between Estes Kefauver from Tennessee and John F. Kennedy from Massachusetts. And they actually had a balloting to choose the vice president. Well, this happened uh, in the 1944 Democratic Convention. And the puzzling thing that happened was FDR did not really want to run with Truman. Uh, Tr Truman, apparently amongst the possible uh, substitutions for uh, Henry Wallace, he was the least objectionable amongst the most people. He was out of the machine politics of Missouri and Kansas City, um, but he had a pretty high profile as a senator. Uh, a, a, his, one of his big issues was cutting out waste and uh, in the defense, not the defense department, the war department, and um, other parts of the preparation for war, which, um, uh, and the execution of the war. Uh, so he had a high profile. Um, when he became president, by the way, he's the only president we've had who never uh, went to college, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, so he was kind of a common man type guy. Uh, 
So they actually went through balloting, and on the third ballot, uh, the politicians had their way, and um, Harry Truman became the vice presidential candidate. FDR wasn't that happy with it. If he, had a, if he couldn't have Henry Rawls, he had a couple of choices that he would have done, but he chose, it's kind of puzzling, but he, he didn't speak up, and he didn't exert any leadership, and it could have been partly the effect of his illness. He was very ill, and it was pretty clear to most people that were close to it that um, assuming he won a fourth term, he probably wouldn't live to complete it. So essentially, when they chose Harry Truman, they chose the next president, assuming that uh, he would win the election. It was an interesting election in uh, 1940 because the Republicans came up with a surprise. Uh, the nominee uh, was um, a um, private businessman, Wendell Wilkie. I think he's the closest example to the Donald Trump situation who, Donald Trump who was a private businessman, had no government experience. Now Wendell Wilkie had a lot of experience in the international area and um, uh, was more involved in government than Donald Trump was, but it's a similar thing. He was a private businessman, no government experience. And uh, Wendell Welke, uh, the, the election was in doubt up to the end, and FDR didn't really campaign that much uh, because of what was going on internationally and domestically. And um, in the end, FDR won the presidency, Harry Truman became vice president, and in about 80 days, uh, FDR died, and uh, Harry Truman took over. And historians now recount the fact that FDR did little to prepare Harry Truman to conduct the war or act as president. And it was, uh, you know, a challenging time, partly because of the war, but, um, also economically and um, really there were times in which in that um, Harry Truman's term as president having taken over for FDR in which he was really pretty unpopular and it was really an open question whether he would run for re-election in 1948. Um, uh, so again, it's, it's similar to what happened when FDR ran for a third term. He, didn't, he played coy and he didn't really campaign for getting the nomination and he waited to be asked to run for another term. But in this case, he then did not intervene and provide any leadership about um, picking his running mate. Really not the best part of FDR's legacy because he knew his health was failing. It was important and he chose to sit on the sidelines. It may have been the effect of his illness, possibly. Um, now, um, FDR's opponent, um, uh, running for a fourth term was our old friend Thomas Dewey, Republican governor of New York. So when the time came to run in 48, Dewey had the advantage of having run a national campaign. And, and he lost, but he did well. And under the circumstances, you can understand uh, why the public supported FDR. Uh, because of the war effort, because of the economic situation. And, um, you know, soon after that, when Congress passed and got approval for the 22nd Amendment, which limited a president to two terms. That was a direct result of the FDR experience. Uh, particularly, the Republicans did not want to go through another situation where there was going to be a president with multiple terms. They felt two terms was plenty. Uh, the um, 
there were economic issues, there were the war issues, there were labor problems. Um, uh, Truman, uh, in taking a position he was going to run again, um, took pretty strong, by those standards of that day, pretty strong positions on some controversial areas like civil rights. He integrated the military. Um, he did housing programs that were aimed at uh, the minority community. Uh, today we look at those and we say, you know, it was good, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really enough. Um, but um, that uh, created some uh, tension within the Democratic Party. Uh, the Republican Party had similar tensions. Dewey won the nomination in, in 1948 to run again, but it was the continuing um, dynamic uh, of the Republican Party split between conservatives and what they used to refer to as the Eastern establishment. And even though his running mate, Earl Warren, was the governor of California, he was part of the Eastern establishment. Um, liberal, maybe, maybe moderate, but certainly not conservative. The big uh, conservative Republican that was sort of the leader and challenged Dewey at the convention was Robert Taft from Ohio. Um, it, interestingly enough, in the, as the two parties were going through the uh, nomination procedure, uh, both parties, Republicans and Democrats, in 1948, reached out to Dwight Eisenhower. They didn't know what party he was he belonged to. It wasn't known, and uh, both parties wanted him to run, including Truman, by the way, who also did the same thing when he chose not to run in 1952. And of course, now we know uh, Eisenhower ended up running as a Republican in 52. At the time in 48, his feeling was. Uh, military pe people had no business in government. Now, we have a history uh, that we've addressed in some of these other lectures of military people using their military prowess and fame to uh, run for and become president. Some were successful, some were not, but, you know, think back to Andrew Jackson and the war, his performance of the War of 1812. Um, the, the two uh, Whig candidates, the one in the 40s, William Henry Harrison and Zachary Taylor, were both generals. You have US, uh, Ulysses Grant, uh, you know, a very successful Civil War general. Um, so, and we've had generals that were not successful but got the nomination, like Winfield Scott and others. So. We did have a little bit of a tradition of turning to military people for political leadership. In uh, 48, Eisenhower said that's not appropriate, but in 52, he ended up, he played a little coy too, and was clearly a moderate in the eyes of conservative Republicans. So going back to Truman, he, he had problems. Uh, his problems were on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, he was, uh, his civil rights positions were uh, not supported by conservative Southern Democrats. And Henry Wallace, who, who got pushed out as vice president by the party regulars, but who stayed on in the cabinet as Commerce Secretary, uh, really opposed uh, a lot of Truman's agenda from a more liberal or moderate side. He opposed the concept of the Truman Doctrine. I mean, Harry Truman uh, rather aggressively uh, faced the issue of uh, um, fighting communism. Um, 
he is, he is the beginning of the Cold War. Um, if Henry Wallace had been president, I think there's a pretty good chance we wouldn't have had that kind of uh, Cold War stance. Um, and a matter of fact, uh, Truman fired him as Commerce Secretary because he uh, was much more accommodating publicly talking about the Soviet Union. You know, remember the Soviet Union was uh, cut a deal with the Nazis and then uh, got thrown in the war on our side when the Nazis invaded them. And so they were a, an important war ally. But the suspicion related to the Cold War stemmed in large part behind the U.S. Um, and uh, Great Britain war strategy. And Truman uh, bought into that strategy rather quickly. There was always the feeling among historians that FDR wasn't that, um, had issues with Winston Churchill. And the main, the really compelling issue was uh, Soviet's request to open up a um, Western Front in World War II. Uh, Churchill, I think it's a fair assessment of uh, his position he was, he delayed that and very effectively lobbied against it. Um, uh, and meanwhile, you know, the Soviet Union suffered more casualties in World War II than all the other countries combined. So Stalin was very suspicious of the West, in part because of this stance on war strategy. And some people think it would have been different if FDR had lived but Truman bought into that approach. Now Truman also, remember it was a two front war, the Pacific and the, uh, in Europe. And uh, Truman, um, you know, uh, famously had to address the issue of the use of atomic weapons against the Japanese. The problem was uh, to accomplish unconditional surrender, which was the position of the Allies in the Pacific, it was going to be a tough road to hoe because uh, uh, we were moving island by island, getting closer and closer to Japan, but it was pretty clear that the military leadership was not going to, um, for first of all, a negotiated peace was not in the cards anyway. But it was uh, going to be a very difficult uh, military operation uh, different than Europe. Um, and in the end, Truman made the very difficult decision to uh, use our atomic weapons against the Japanese, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you know, uh, we're the only uh, country in the world that has ever used uh, atomic power this way. Um, and uh, it's been a debate of an among historians since it happened. Um, but generally speaking, Truman um, got uh, support for being decisive and carrying through on FDR's war strategy, which was uh, certainly compatible with uh, Great Britain and Winston Churchill. Um, now, the result of the two nominations for 1948 was um, uh, Dewey kept the conservatives and Robert Taft, even though they were unhappy. Why go with this Eastern establishment guy again? He lost in 44. They felt they had a unique opportunity now to, to uh, win the presidency uh, because Truman was pretty unpopular. And overwhelmingly, political commentators, um, pollsters, were saying that Dewey was going to win the election. Uh, Gallup and Roper polls showed Dewey with a pretty considerable lead to the point where they made the mistake of not polling right up to the end. 
It reminds me a little bit of uh, the 2016 race in which um, in October, around the time of the Access Hollywood tape issue, uh, Hillary Clinton amassed a pretty substantial lead. But the pollsters got it wrong because they didn't keep polling because that lead was aided in part by Russian interference, apparently, we've now learned. But she was losing support right up to Election Day. So she did end up winning, she did end up winning the popular vote. But as we know, not the Electoral College vote. That can happen. It doesn't happen a lot, but it can happen. I'm also reminded of, of 1988 when um, uh, George Bush Sr., as a sitting vice president, was running for president against the governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis. When Michael Dukakis left the Democratic Convention in the summer, he had a 20-point lead. Uh, Bush was, uh, you know, fighting history here because we hadn't had a sitting vice president that had been elected president since Martin Van Buren in, you know, let's see, 1836. Um, there's a reason why that is. It's hard when you're representing the incumbent party, but you're not the incumbent. But what, in a terrible campaign manager, much like was done with Dewey and the Republicans. Dukakis, uh, you know, relaxed and, and didn't, didn't really get campaigning until the fall uh, when he, he should have been protecting his lead. And of course, he ended up losing by, you know, fairly substantial margin. Um, well, whoever ran Dewey's campaign miscalculated enormously. Um, but he kept the conservatives and Robert Taft, who supported him. Not so with Harry Truman. Um, the Southern Democrats uh, walked out of the convention in 48, uh, mostly over the civil rights plank that Truman was pushing. They ended up forming a uh, well, we, they've been called in the history books Dix Dixiecrats, <laughs> uh, but the name of the party was the States' Rights Party. Strom Thurmond was the candidate from South Carolina. And on the other side of the spectrum, Henry Wallace ran on the ticket of the Progressive Party. And he was opposed to many Truman initiatives, particularly in international relations, but others too. Um, he was uh, uh, very vocal in his criticism of the foreign policy of creating what we now review, uh, identify as the, as the Cold War between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States <clears throat> that lasted until really the fall of uh, the um, Soviet Union uh, during the administration of uh, George Bush Sr and the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Um, so, think of what Truman is facing here. First of all, he's pretty unpopular. Um, he's lost the Southern Democrats. He's lost the progressive with Henry Wall. So you got three Democrats running for president and uh, against, you know, a Republican candidate, Thomas Dewey, who had, had just run a full national campaign, so he had a head start, really. It's interesting to look at the strategy of um, the Southern Whites. Uh, it's an early example of the Electoral College strategy and Electoral College politics. What Strom Thurmond and the Southern Democrats were trying to do was take away enough electoral college votes that the vote would be thrown to the House. Remember how that works in the Constitution. Um, you have to win a majority of the electoral college votes. Uh, you know, think back to the 1824 election when Andrew Jackson won the popular vote. 
and the Electoral College vote, but not enough of the Electoral College vote. And he, the, the election was thrown to the House of Representatives, and the, uh, his opponent, his main opponent, John Quincy Adams, cut a deal with uh, the third place finisher, offering him the Secretary of State's position, uh, arguably. Uh, and he threw his support to uh, John Quincy Adams, who uh, um, carried a majority <clears throat> of the states in the House. So he became president. Remember, Andrew Jackson was limited, resigned from his Senate seat, worked for four years to undermine John Quincy Adams, and came back to win decisively in 1828 and then re-elected in 1832. Um, so, uh, not an unheard of strategy and pretty obvious that that's what their uh, plan was. Um, uh, Henry Wallace actually got a fair number of popular votes, not that far off of what Strom Thurmond got, but he didn't win any uh, electoral college votes. You know, in our, our next discussion, which is going to be on May 10th, we'll discuss third party politics in uh, presidential elections. One of the challenges is the electoral college vote. Um, except for two states, which is a fairly recent phenomenon, is winner take all. You could win the state, well, look, look at the 2000 election. George uh, W. Bush <laughs> carried Florida by about 500 votes, uh, but he got all the electoral college votes in Florida. And he lost the popular vote by, you know, 500,000 votes, roughly, to Al Gore. Um, so. The Progressive Party got a number of votes, theoretically taken from the Democrats. And on the right, the uh, States' Rights Party, uh, mostly on the issue of race, uh, obviously is taking votes away from the Democratic candidate also. So how the heck <laughs> did Truman win? I mean, right up to the end, everyone is talking about, I'm going to win. There's that famous picture of him holding up the Chicago Tribune that said, uh, Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, uh, there's a, often there are done radio clips of Keltenborn, who was a commentator on, I think, NBC radio, uh, throughout the night claiming votes are going to come in and eventually Dewey is going to win, even though uh, Truman was leading. Truman went to bed early, and uh, when he got up, he realized he'd, uh, he'd won re-election. Well, how did it happen? Dewey ran a terrible campaign. He thought he had it won. He was criticized for not offering any comments of any substance, platitudes. He didn't campaign very vigorously. He thought he already had it won, so he didn't want to take a chance. A little like the Dukakis example in 1988. So, uh, huge mistake. Ba very badly run campaign. On the other hand, Truman set out with the objective of going after groups of voters, blacks, farmers, labor, big push to consumers about the, the comeback in the economy. Um, and he aggressively campaigned. He criticized Congress for as do-nothing Congress. Remember, when you're... Um, when you're running for president, you also have the entire House up for election and a good part of the Senate. So if you decide to take a pass and not campaign vigorously, you are hurting your undercard. And Truman was supporting all the other Democrats who were running and, you know, the image is largely of him uh, taking a uh, train tour around the country and campaigning vigorously, criticizing Congress and going after those specific groups who began to see him as a legitimate choice. So how did it happen? Well, Strom Thurmond did not do as well as they thought he was going to do. He won three states. 
won South Carolina, he won Alabama, and he won Louisiana. He didn't win the other Southern states. So he had, I don't know, 39, 40 electoral votes. Uh, you know, good, good amount of the popular vote. Um, uh, not that different than the popular vote totals of Henry Wallace, but Henry Wallace got no electoral college votes. The election was closer than has uh, often been um, discussed. It's because of the electoral college system. Dewey came very, very close to winning the electoral college vote, even though he lost the popular vote pretty substantially. So his key states for Truman were Ohio, Illinois, and California. Those three states, uh, Truman won by less than 1%. A shift of maybe 30,000 votes in those three states would have given Dewey the Electoral College victory. It's a little like 2016, remember? Uh, uh, Trump won three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, by 80,000 votes. So he lost the popular vote by three million, but squeaked by in the Electoral College vote. It's, you know, the system, uh, that possibility always exists in that system. Our system with the Electoral College is more fragile than we're ever willing to talk about. But it was true in 1948 also. So in effect, Truman very, um, he won three states, California, Illinois, and Ohio, by very slim margins. But big electoral count total, and he ended up with more than 300 electoral votes, and he won the election. Trump Thurman did not do as well. The pollsters were long, wrong in large part because uh, they stopped polling. They didn't poll right up to the end. It's not like we have now, you know, day before the election, they're doing polls. And it wasn't as sophisticated as, as the polling is now. Um, so they didn't detect the shift from September through November uh, to Truman. And what happened in the end, post-polling showed, is that Truman captured like 75% of the um, uh, undecided voters. And so there was a, a, a big shift towards Truman as the election got closer to election day. And Truman's, well, I mean, what did he have to lose? Everyone assumed he was gonna lose, so he went after everybody very aggressively, and it played well, and it worked for him. Um, And how different would things have been if um, Truman had not been inserted into the vice presidential position? Everybody knew that uh, FDR was very ill, and, uh, and the insiders all felt that the vice president would be the next president. Because Henry Wallace had a very, very different political ph philosophy than Truman. Um, he wasn't the anti-communist that Truman was. Uh, you remember in the early 50s, the Red Scare and all that? I mean, it might have been entirely different. The Cold War, would it have been different if uh, we had someone that was more accommodating to the Soviet Union? And a lot of historians believe that FDR would have been more accommodating if he had lived. Now. Um, bottom line, uh, the presidency of Harry Truman has generally been viewed by historians as successful. He's viewed as being decisive. He's viewed as uh, doing a good job at handling the war effort. He's viewed as doing the right thing in terms of the economy. Um, his biggest uh, drawback was his relations with Congress, which obviously was not good. But in addition, remember what I said about the undercard of the election? Well, when Truman won, he carried with them uh, a bunch of candidates for the Senate and the House of Representatives, so the Democrats had control 
of uh, Congress as well as the presidency after the 1948 election. That changed in 1950. And of course, the Republicans turned to, instead of turning to their traditional conservative base with the Robert Taft type nominee, they went with the glamorous uh, general, successful general uh, Eisenhower, and uh, he got elected and reelected. Um, so uh, the the strategy definitely it worked. Um, uh, eventually for the Republicans in making a comeback after that disastrous uh, 1948 campaign. Um, so, might have been different, but it wasn't. Uh, when I say historians generally rate the Truman presidency favorably, every year historians rank the presidents. Now, we had a previous course here last year in the history of U.S. presidential campaigns. And at the request of the participants that went through the course, it was a six-week course, um, I gave them the latest um, ranking of presidents by historians. Now, that, that ranking changes over time because we look at some things differently over time. An example would be Andrew Jackson has gone down. There was this uh, myth of the populist Jackson, who was a very polarizing political person, um, created by uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and his um, uh, um, Andrew Jackson biography. Uh, uh, on the other hand, people like George Bush Sr., who lost his bid for re-election, has gone up in the rankings because he is now generally uh, viewed as making the right decisions about um, dealing with um, Iraq um, and um, in addition to uh, international, uh, he got in big political trouble because he reneged on his uh, no new taxes pledge, but that was because he cut a deal with the Democrats to reduce spending and increase taxes. And he set the stage, really, for the Clinton-Gingrich um, uh, partnership. They hated each other, but they got together to do this. Remember, in the last three years of the Clinton administration, we actually had annual budget surpluses, and we started to pay down the debt. So Bush has started to recover. Um, another president who's gone up is uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Believe it or not, Dwight Eisenhower is now ranking fifth on the list of presidents. The, the top three are always the same. George Washington, um, FDR, and Abraham Lincoln in whatever order you want to put them. So um, in the most recent um, ranking, the fourth was Teddy Roosevelt. Um, number five is Dwight Eisenhower, which used to be viewed as a kind of a, a moderate, ineffectual politician, but he has gained in stature over time. And guess who's number six? Harry Truman. So uh, he survived all his enemies. Uh, he uh, has been recognized as a successful president. Um, following on the legacy of FDR, and in 1948 won the biggest political upset of the 19th century. Um, I'm sorry, the 20th century. Um, so that's the story of the presidency of Harry Truman and his amazing election triumph in 1948. Now remember our next um, lecture will be the last of the spring lectures. It's going to be May 10th, and it'll be on third party politics in presidential elections. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, I'll be back to you in the week. Thank you.